Thank you for joining me for this edition of Immigration Crisis, the Fight for the Southern Border. I'm Demi Virgen with Sinclair Broadcasting Group. I am currently in Panama City, Panama. This is a country I'm extremely knowledgeable about. You see, I was born here. Many of my families here and also in the United States. You see, my dad was in the U.S. military. Now, Panama is located on an isthmus. It connects North America to South America. It has also become a route for hundreds of thousands of migrants from all over the world. Since 2019, myself and photojournalist Brian Sanchez and Pablo Cavazos have traveled here to Panama, specifically to the Darien province, which borders Colombia, to see the migration pattern, to share the stories of those who use this path to get to the United States. One of those major groups has been the Cubans, some whom we have followed and met on the Texas border once their journey was over. Three years later, the journey through Panama's Darien Gap, one of the most dangerous jungles in the world, continues. Chief Jason Owen, in charge of the Del Rio sector for the U.S. Border Patrol, which includes Eagle Pass and Uvalde, is seeing a lot of those who cross through Panama's Darien Gap in his sector in record numbers. He also knows the pain that many migrants suffer along the way some even losing their lives. In this segment of Immigration Crisis, the fight for the southern border, Owen sends a message in Spanish to some who may be still here in Panama waiting to continue their migration north before he says it is too late. Chief Owen, I want to start by asking you, what are you seeing right now? We're right now in Panama City, I've been seeing the numbers. I get the numbers often sent to us from Panama as to what they're seeing along the border. And there seems to be some changes. The numbers are still high, but the routes are changing a little bit. Are you starting to hear that at the border there in Del Rio? The traffic that we're seeing is is largely the same as it has been for the past several months. And I just kind of pointed out the... uh, you know, the, the shifts and traffic patterns that we'll see, whether it's here or, or in Mexico, that's that's not uncommon for us to see, depending on the impact that, that we, our partners in GOM, are, are having on on disrupting that flow and, and the criminals that are that are that are impacting it. So what I basically say, okay. we're not seeing we're not seeing a lot of change on the border compared to what we've, what we've been experiencing the last several months. And and it's not unusual to see shifts in traffic like that. The changes that I'm hearing here are basically the routes that they are taking. But now that Cubans are also now flying to Nicaragua and then going to specifically, which I found it very odd that they're going to Piedras. So they're taking a different route of flying out to Nicaragua because they're finding it more difficult, you know, and as word is getting out, which is amazing to me. We've been seeing people come through the Darien Gap for a while, and all of a sudden, you know, they're changing it, that they're not going through there. But it was, it took it about a year for them to realize how dangerous it is to go through there. Is that surprising to you? Well, so knowing the the Darien Gap, uh, not as well as as you and your family know it, of course, but that it's surprising to me that anybody would would want to risk it and go through that area because, you know, that's been, that's been a dangerous area for quite some time. But it, so much of the, the shifts in traffic patterns happen because of word of mouth, because of uh, information being shared on social media by those that are, that are coming across, by the, uh, by the smugglers themselves. And so I, I guess it doesn't surprise me that it could take some time for, for word to get out and, and make its way all the way down to those, those points of origin where folks are actually coming from. But, but like you, you know, it's, I think it's dangerous and, and it has been for quite some time to try and, and try and go through that area. So I guess in one sense, from a, from a safety standpoint, that's, that's good news. Tell me about the people that you are seeing. What are your numbers looking like? What are the, the breakdowns of those numbers, children, women, what countries, what are you seeing right now? So we're still seeing, like I said, on, on average of about 1300 uh, people a day that we're, that we're catching and usually anywhere from two thirds to three fourths of that are single adults. So here in Del Rio, the number of family units and, and unaccompanied children that we're seeing still represent a, a relatively small number of the overall population that's coming across. The, the countries that we see the most are the, the folks from, from Cuba, from Colombia, from Nicaragua, from Venezuela, 
that, uh, that that make up the the majority of the people that we're currently holding in custody. What are you doing to get ready? I mean, the summer months, and even though it's extremely hot right now in Texas, the summer months are when you guys usually see an uptick, right? It is, and that's that's where we we shift to uh, our our rescue posture. We have our Boar Star teams and our EMT uh, uh, personnel that are deployed to those those high risk areas, especially within the sector, the the more remote areas. We have the rescue beacons deployed. We have the special operations group uh, personnel, the the national Boar Star team that will that will send personnel down to augment the uh, the special operations detachment that we have here at sector. So that more than anything, those are the. The, the changes that we typically see every summer so that we can try and be there as much as possible to to make those rescues and save the lives where we can, along with the messaging campaign. You know, we have a we have a very good strategic communications branch that constantly works on the messaging to put out just how dangerous it is to not only to cross through here, but to, but to make that journey uh, at all. And we've started seeing some of the tactics that uh, that the smugglers continue to use, you know, the locking people in trains, uh, locking people in uh, in u-haul uh, trailers or in, in small compartments so we, the uh, the dump trucks that we've been uh, that we've been seeing that that are being used as, as smuggling methods where people are just they're packed in and it's uh, there's no air conditioning there's no water and they're there for hours and and uh, and we've had people die already that uh, that have been in those conditions and and as we've continually said for years now the, the smugglers absolutely do not care so messaging about uh, being on uh, being aware of the dangers in those tactics and to not put yourself in that situation the dangers that come with you know crossing through an environment like uh, del rio where it's desert there's not a lot of water extreme temperatures Trying to make sure people are aware and educated uh, what they're facing if they're going to be putting themselves in, the, in this type of a situation. That more than anything is what most sectors will be doing this time of year to get ready for these summer months to try and save as many lives as we possibly can. Chief, and it's amazing to me that you're talking about that and the messaging. And uh, there is uh, a woman that I will be um, having on one of the podcasts who's from Colombia, who's here in Panama. And the conversation that I had with her, it, unreal, unreal. And her family urging her not to make that trek. You've made it to Panama. You're living in a good area. You're making money. The Panamanian government is actually going out of their way to offer people a path to be able to work in this country. And, you know, the urging of her husband to get to the United States. Let's go, let's go. It's just amazing to me that people still, you know, don't quite get how dangerous this is. And that's, that's something that we contend with almost every day. I mean, it, it's so I think whenever people hear us talking about the dangers and, and, and that, uh, that it's not worth making the trip, they may question our motives uh, because from an enforcement standpoint, you know, we're there to, to stop uh, any illicit traffic coming across the border. But it comes from a good place. It comes from the men and women that are out there in the field each and every day that we are the ones that actually see these deaths. We are the ones that actually make these rescues. We see the conditions that these people find themselves in. Some of them are lucky to escape with their lives. We are the ones that, that are providing the emergency medical care to these folks whenever they're massively dehydrated or they're, they're injured along the way. We're the ones that see the inside of these stash houses or have to go inside these tractor trailers when it's 150 plus degrees to help pull these folks out. When we're talking about the dangers of this trip, it's coming from experience. It's coming from being there and seeing what these folks are having to go through. It, it's absolutely not worth it from the moment these folks leave their home and they put themselves in the hands of of criminals. Let, let's be very frank with who, with who these, these smugglers are. These are criminals that are trying to circumvent the uh, the processes that, that, that multiple countries have in place, and they do not care if you live or die. They do not care. All they care about is making as much money as they possibly can. It's a very, unfortunately, a very lucrative business for them, but it comes at the cost of lives of innocent people, and that's what we see each and every day, especially here in a place like Del Rio. Yeah, and I think also with the population that you're getting now, you, you hit it also. Um, people often think that it's only, you know, people from Guatemala or people from Mexico that are coming. There's people from Colombia and Venezuela that are now coming 
at a different rate because of the political situation in their country. But those people, a lot of them are not quite ready for the realities of what it is when you're trying to cross like this. A lot of these people are educated and may not have lived, you know, out in a farm rural area where you're going to have to survive in extreme heat. And I think, I don't know, tell me, how surprised do you think a lot of them are when they have to go through all of this and they come, you know, asking for help from Border Patrol? Well, and I'll go one step further before I, before I answer that question, Yami, to kind of reinforce what you just said. So just here in Del Rio alone, this fiscal year, we have caught people from 107 different countries. So it is not just folks from the Northern Triangle. It is not just folks from Central and South America. This, we're talking about people from all over the world that, that have no idea what's in store for them whenever they, they move through environments like this. And, and I can tell you from personal experience, uh, you know, when I was on the Borstar team and, and, and taking part in these, uh, in these rescue efforts out in California, we would come across people that were told by the smugglers that it was a two hour walk and they would have one bottle of water. And sometimes they would be wearing shorts and, and sandals. And we knew, and the smugglers knew that it was several days by foot to get to where they were going. They were lied to, they were told something different. And, and had they even known that it was a several day journey by foot, they would not have been prepared to make a trip like that. In fact, nobody can be prepared to make a trip like that. When you're talking about temperatures in excess of 100 degrees with the heat index being even higher, where there's no shade, there's no water, a person cannot carry enough water for themselves or anybody else and be out there in that environment for days on end and get to where they need to be in a safe manner. It just can't happen. Another thing that many people don't understand and, and speaking to some of them here in Panama is the fact that once they get there, you're not going to, if you're not married, you're not going to stay together. Men are going to be sent one way. Women are going to be sent another way. They have this image of, you know, they walk in, they stay together and, you know, the whole process is together. You're probably going to be separated from the group that you traveled with, right? Well, yeah. So first off, there's, there's no guarantee that the smugglers are going to keep you together. That's uh, there's, we find people that get separated by the smugglers all the time or get left behind by the smugglers if, if they if they can't keep up. Whenever they get into our custody, we do everything we can to keep the uh, the, the people you know intact with uh, with the folks that they came with. But at the end of the day, we had to think about the security and the safety of everybody involved. And so we we will not put males and females in the same holding cells. We will not put children with adults in the same holding cells unless we can dedicate that cell to just that family. And then it becomes a capacity issue. If we're, if we're catching, you know, 1300 people a day, we only have so much uh, holding space to, to use. And so a lot of times that does mean that people are, are put in different holding areas while the processing is taking place, but that's, that has to take place. It's, it's actually a policy to make sure that everybody is, is kept safe while they're in our custody. For the people that you're seeing come in, the ones that say that they've made that trek, you know, through Colombia, through Panama, through Central America, when you're getting them, what type of injuries do you get them with after that journey? Well, it's not uncommon whenever we encounter them, you know, out, out in the desert that they're, they're in a state of dehydration. You know, they, they've been out there, they're, they're badly sunburned, or they, they'll have uh, blisters on their feet. You know, they, uh, sometimes they, they, they roll an ankle. Sometimes they, they've, they've broken limbs. Sometimes if they're in those, uh, in those, those compartments that we're talking about, it goes beyond just being dehydrated where they've already entered into heat exhaustion and in worst cases, heat stroke. And we just had one, uh, just the other day that, uh, was part of a, uh, a load we pulled out of a, a belly dump truck. That's the kind that empties out of the bottom that had over 60 people in it. And one of them was already dead. Whenever we found them, we we tried to did everything we could to save their life, but they uh, they was uh, they were too far gone. And and it begs the question, you know, it, had we not interdicted that uh, that load and had it gone to wherever it was going, how many more would have died by the time they got there? We already had one die. We already had one that was in a bad state. There's several that were in a bad state but when we got to them. By the time they got to let's say San Antonio or wherever their their ultimate destination. Is it reasonable to think that others might have already died? And, and what would have happened to them? What would the smugglers have done? Uh, th those are questions that, uh, that, that we ask ourselves all the time. That 
there's no answer for those uh, those those questions for the ones that we don't interdict, that we don't see, that we don't catch. That's why it's so very important to have us out on patrol and and trying to catch everything that we can, not just for the security and safety of the people in this country, but for the migrants as well. Chief, when when people do arrive there, security wise, you are running them because we often see the press releases where you're talking about the number of uh, felony. Uh, sometimes there are sex offenders that are trying to get back into the country. So those checks and balances you guys are doing, they're at the border are the same to an extent that they're doing in Panama. I, I know when I go out to that end, we see, you know, U.S. personnel there doing biometrics, doing Interpol, uh, running fingerprints right alongside of Panamanian Border Patrol, uh, which they're called Senafron. So that job that they're doing there, they may catch some of them, but you still have to run them through when they get there to the border, correct? That's absolutely right. So that it, And that's, at the end of the day, we all have to remember what the mission of the U.S. Border Patrol is, and it, that, that is border security. Our, our mission is a security mission, and it's important not to conflate the security mission with immigration and the humanitarian mission that, that, that comes with that. The concern that for us that comes from the influx that we're seeing right now is that it takes us off of that security mission. The people that we that we put out in so, on social media that we're coming across, that's to create awareness of there are criminal elements out there that are taking advantage of this humanitarian crisis, of this migration influx that, that we're seeing. There are bad people that are trying to either mix in with these economic migrants that are trying to come in looking for a better way of life. There are people that are trying to uh, evade capture, evade our capture by crossing in other areas where we can't be because we're dealing with that humanitarian crisis. That is what impacts the people of this country each and every day. That some of these people that we see, uh, we're talking convicted murderers. We're talking people that have been they're sexual predators. They've done they've done jail time. They're they're narcotic smugglers. They're gang members. They come from special interest countries that have a known terrorist nexus. There are people out there that do mean to do harm to the people of this country if they're able to make it in. That is why the Border Patrol exists. That is why we need to be out there on patrol. We will always be there to lend a helping hand in a humanitarian crisis and do what we can to save lives. Because at the end of the day, the men and women that wear this uniform, they're public servants, they're first responders. They felt that calling to do something to serve a greater good. They'll always be there for that. But while they're occupied in that mission, they're not able to do the mission that the American people depend on them to do each and every day on the security front. Would you like to say something that people that may hear this podcast, people like the young woman that I'm, I'm speaking to you about that are still on the fence about making that trek all the way up to your border and expecting to just, you know, be a walk, you know, an easy walk into the country. Bueno, voy a, voy a tratar de hacerlo en español, pero recuerde que vengo de Oklahoma y, y prácticamente no puedo hablar ni inglés, mucho menos español. Pero le voy a decir a todos que realmente no vale la pena el viaje, porque es bien peligroso desde el momento que salga de su casa hasta el momento que, que llega a nosotros. Está en peligro. Los criminales que, que, que son los contrabandistas, realmente a ellos no les importa la vida de ustedes. Y desde el momento que, que está en las manos de ella de ellos realmente eh, están en peligro. Las casas de seguridad van a estar allí una semana o dos semanas sin agua, sin baño, sin aire acondicionado, uh, cruzando el río, el corriente bien fuerte. Tenemos gente que se muere todo, uh, cada año. De hecho, hasta ahorita tenemos más de 80 personas en este año fiscal que, que han fallecido por, por el río, por el desierto, por por toda manera, a las manos de, de los contrabandistas. Y los trailers y uh, las camionetas, iguales. Y una vez que llega a su, su destino, a saber lo que va a pasar, porque realmente esa gente le, le, van, le, le van a poner a, a trabajar en condiciones muy graves. Y si, si viene con, con su familia, si viene con niños, es peor. Porque imagínense, tenemos criminales sexuales cruzando por la misma ruta que ustedes están pensando en cruzar. Tenemos criminales de, uh, denunciados por homicidio, uh, de marras, de, de, de traficantes de drogas, cruzando por la misma ruta que ustedes están pensando en cruzar. Entonces, cuando digo que, que no vale la pena este viaje, que es 
que está bien peligroso, es de corazón que digo eso. Your Spanish is very good. And that, that message will definitely uh, come across to those people who were, will hear this message. And I will be playing this message for this woman from Colombia who's on the fence on what to do. Her husband urging her, let's go to America. And she's looking around going, I, I have a good life here in Panama. Why should I try and attempt this? So I think your words will be heard by her and other people who are right now trying to decide, do we continue? Do we stay where we're at right now when they're offering us work and a place to make a good living and a good life without putting our lives in danger? So I, I really appreciate your words and I really appreciate uh, your, your job and the mission and, and the job that all the men and women are doing uh, down there in Del Rio. Well, thank you, Yannis. And again, uh, for, uh, on behalf of all of us here, thank you for what you're doing to get that message out there. I, I do think it will save lives ultimately. That was Chief Owen in charge of the Del Rio sector, which includes Uvalde and Eagle Pass for the U.S. Border Patrol. That message from Owen will be shared with a young woman here in Panama who's from Colombia and is still deciding if she will follow her husband or stay here and make a life in this country who right now has accepted her. I sit down with her in our next segment. In Panama City, Republic of Panama, for Sinclair Broadcasting, I am Jamie Virgen. Thank you for joining us and be on the lookout for our next edition of Immigration Crisis, The Fight for the Southern Border.